Good morning and welcome to this morning's Knowledge Bank. Uh, in this session, MRR Software and several leading organisations who have successfully diverse, diversified rather, into the exciting build to rent sector um, will be discussing and debating many of the prominent challenges and lessons learned when moving into new asset classes. If you have any questions throughout the session, then please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And our panelists will try their best to get through as many as possible at the end. Um, the webinar is being recorded recorded today and will be available to watch back later today via the News on the Block YouTube channel. Um, without further ado, I will now pass you over to Dan MRI, um, who will kick things off and introduce you to our panellists today. Great, so hi, I'm Dan Foroshevsky. I'm head of the Investor Solutions team at MRI Software. Um, we're the largest prop tech provider in Europe um, and my team focused specifically um, on the sort of agency and investor market in the UK covering you know, residential, um, which is why I'm so excited to bring together today a panelist of people um, who sort of work within the industry who um, have made the journey from block management into BTR, which are two sectors that my team are very interested and active in. Um, so I think if we can quickly go around and introduce the panelists and um, we'll start getting into some of the questions. Um, so Catherine, if you wanted to introduce yourself. Hi, thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. Good to um, be here today. I'm Catherine Rose. I'm Managing Director of Verb Life. Verb Life are a um, built to rent and beds operator. So um, we're in the single family, multifamily and co-living um, sector. We get involved really early at the design phase, helping clients get planning all the way through the design consultancy stage, lettings, mobilisation, all the way through to stabilising the asset. Great. Uh, Nicola, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Nicola. I'm the operations manager for All Sop Letting and Management. So we're a, a management service for the residential investment sector. We look after portfolios of um, leasehold, PRS, and increasingly build to rent as well. So me and my team look at process procedure, compliance um, across across the business, all aspects really. Right, and then Paul. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Paul Noble, I'm Head of Built Rent PRS Operations for HLM Property Management. Uh, we're part of Lampsmith Hampton and in turn part of the Connells Group, uh, so the largest sort of state agency, lettings agency in the country. Um, we, we're the residential arm of LSH, we, we do full operational management of PRS Built to Rent and the sort of core previous area is, is leasehold and estate management as well. Great, and then Ollie? I'm muting there. Um, yeah, I am Ollie Miller. I'm director of Build to Rent and PRS for Pinnacle Group. Um, so Pinnacle managing agent, provide management services to um, around 80,000 homes across the UK. Um, and we span from sort of affordable housing to PRS and Build to Rent and block management. Um, and this year we've just started managing the um, service family accommodation on behalf of um, DOO, GOO, sorry. Um, and we currently, yeah, so provide management services. We're around 10,000 on block management and about two, two and a half thousand now on build to rent. That's great. So obviously we see a lot of block managers that are diversifying into this space. Um, you know, it's something that we um, see from a software perspective. Um, but obviously I'm quite interested from a sort of a business generation perspective um, and you know, what you see is the commercial opportunity. Um, so if I throw it over to Catherine, you know, what were the things that drove you guys to move into the build to rent sector and what do you see as the outlook for build to rent? So I think it's... Um... <laughs> an obvious statement but it was the growth in the sector that drew us to it really um if you look at the bpf figures you can see year on year the sector is going um, it's absolutely booming um we're seeing an increase in single family multi-family diversifying into the regions um a whole range of um product types so it might be mid-market it might be the higher end bells and whistles or it could just be repurposing something above a shop in a small number of units so we are we're seeing a really bright future um, I think it's bright, busy and booming, but I would caveat it to say that um, bill costs are a big challenge at the moment for our clients. Um, getting sites, securing the land opportunities is the challenge we're competing against potentially student and other asset types. So I think um, the future is huge. I think the trend is only on an upwards um, trajectory, but I do think there are some challenges out there for, for operators and our, our institutional clients. Interesting. And Ollie, I'd be interested to get your take on it as well. Yeah, so as 
I mean, it's fairly obvious. I think build to rent it is, as you say, a booming industry. It's it's there's um, so much opportunity out there in terms of um, clients to work with and and what's happening on the ground. But I think for us as Pinnacle, we've always we're very sort of people centric business and we're very much around sort of community and, and building communities. And it's not like the old days where we used to have a, you know, an estate of a certain type of housing. We, we have everything now. And a lot of the sites we manage have block management, they have built to rent, they might have some affordable. Um, so it's really important for us if we're going to service the whole community and do a really good job of it. It's something we felt we really need to move into and make sure we can, we can service sort of the built to rent um, in that sort of world that it's in and make sure that we do a really good job with that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's it's partly that, and it's as I say, a lot of the clients we work with as well just really see the, the opportunity there. So it's, it was a natural fit for us to to move into. Right, and then Nicola, anything that you'd add? Yeah, really similar. I guess we saw the growth where the market was going, and for us, we were really keen on taking our focus on customer service and pushing that to another level which is what build to rent lets us do building a community in a way that for the blocks that we'd managed previously in the more traditional way we we had never managed to have that kind of full community that you get that is expected with build to rent and that was really really appealing for us and paul i'm interested given that you've obviously got the the lettings background as well within the group yeah how you saw that as a, a fit given i suppose you had lettings and block management did that seem a natural progression yeah i think so i think we you know i think seeing the opportunity as everyone said it you know you couldn't ignore it um i think we were as part of the country right at the time now connell's we had a bit of a unique position that we had a core block management building management business but then the lettings branch network as well so it's, it makes it sort of quite unique or very unique and it was a, an opportunity i think it's becoming going to become more of an opportunity as built to rent moves more into single family more regional location that 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 opportunity comes more to our strengths um and as nick said i think i think coming from a block management background myself there was always that frustration that you you had to stop at the front door mm-hmm. and you you had a set of very set rules that you could stick to whereas build to rent you could go beyond that and go not just manage the building but create that place and where people want to live and not and you know do more and actually see some benefit of that that's interesting. I obviously a couple of you mentioned single family in there. So for you know, for anyone that doesn't know, obviously the the BTR sector, you know, reasonably new in the UK, sort of six years. But what I've definitely seen over the last three years definitely is a bigger push on single family housing, sort of institutional money coming in, buying sort of wholesale stock with house builders. Um, are you finding that single families are sort of a larger percentage of the business that you're all pitching at now? Um, than it was even a couple of years ago yes absolutely it, it, it is for us yeah I think um really I think single family I think it's um it seems to be on trend at the moment <laughs> um, and I think it, that's interesting to talk about the branch network um previously I part, well, was part of the LSL um group so we um in a previous role um had a huge network including Marsh and Parsons, Reeds Rains and another Your Move and I think that the challenge there, I think it works really well for single family housing because you're letting up a small amount. So that branch network is a strength. I think it'd be interesting to know kind of from Paul's perspective, whether it, it's joined up enough because I think the branches have all got their own objectives. And unless they understand build to rent, they're not going to get the downstream maintenance or any of the renewals. So it's, I think it's a really interesting um, it, it should work on paper. Absolutely. But I think in practice, um, it, I think there's a bit of a, a, a cultural change to get it all joined up, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, there is. There, there is a challenge absolutely in there. And, you know, we, we make points to our clients that what we do as a build to rent operation leasing team is very different to what our branch network does because their client base is different. Their product is different. Um, and I think it's, you know, where we have branches and city centres that help us with build to rent sites, they're no build to rent. That's, that's part of their awareness. Whereas if you go to a secondary location, build to rent doesn't exist. So it is new to them. Um, I think we're aware of the challenge and it, it, it comes down to getting stakeholders engaged internally, incentivizing them, you know, so they, they see the benefit, um, but also training and make sure they understand not just what their job is, because they didn't understand that, but what's the client in, what is the customer looking for? And that's, that's the real difference from their normal day job. So it is a challenge, but you, you, you know, you go in with that knowledge, it, it actually, you can overcome it. 
yeah, I, I, I agree. I think um, out in the regions, we're definitely um, going more down the regional property manager route. So having somebody roaming yeah. um, and overseeing potentially some of those relationships with a, with a branch if needed. So. so we've actually just had a question come through um, on this topic, though. It was for Catherine and Oliver asking, are you managing the lettings as well in terms of finding tenants or just the building and flat management? And I suppose that goes on to another question I was going to ask of, you know, if you don't have the branch network, you know, what are the sort of lessons learned there about how to effectively let those properties without the people yeah, in a branch? Yeah, so we don't have a branch network, Bird Life doesn't, and the, the company that I'm now with. Um, so as I said, we are we are responsible from start to finish. So it's the handovers, it's helping with the snagging, the defects, it is that lettings piece, it is the then the ongoing management. We um, we currently don't outsource that um, to a branch network. We feel that we want to uh, control that customer journey. We want to validate that um, applicant to make sure it's the best potential um, resident moving in. And we feel that um, by our model at the moment is um, not partnering with local agents, um, not to say we wouldn't do it if it was client led or, or geographical, we needed to, but we do feel that having that relationship from start to finish gives a better customer service and a better customer journey, especially in single family housing. Yeah, and just, just to echo that really, similar sort of approach to myself, so we do the direct service from, from you know, letting up the units to getting it established and moving residents in purely as said just the, on the service levels it's it's much better um we feel but we do we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach so we do we'll assess each scheme as they come to us and if we feel it's the right thing if we need a local presence if it's something particularly niche that we think a local partnership would work better for the building then we're, we're open to doing that and we do work with some estate agents and, and local branches where we we felt the need to but in a general sense yeah we, we do um the full process ourselves um yeah, and I, I just think on that single family point as well, I think what's happened, we've found over that last year is just the uh, last few years with the pandemic, the demand has, has accelerated hugely around what people are looking for. So it's kind of urban areas certainly have bounced back now, but for, for a period of time and still there's a, a demand certainly looking outside where you might get a bit more green space uh, for your money and stuff. Right, and Nicola, is there anything that you wanted to add in on that? Yeah, so we... We don't have a one size fits all model either, and we do. So, we have the built to rent site, so managed on site, letting is done on site, they own that process. And then we have a traditional PRS where we manage the lets, and in some areas, we will um, outsource that to a local agent. And then, increasingly, in the single house, the single family housing that we do. It's a bit of a hybrid model, really. Um, we don't necessarily have people all the time close to the properties, but we want to keep, as Catherine says, control of that process. We are responsible for who we put in that property. So the tech that we use is really important for that. The, um, we're not always there, so we have to have the tech support to, um, to see the customer journey through. Um, so that's been really vital to us. Um, been successful in that um but we we find the hybrid model for single family works quite, is working quite well for us yeah i think sorry just um quickly one of the first clients we were working with um, a few years ago and, and it's phase always sticks in mind they said we built to rent it's much more about finding the right tenant than the first tenant and i think when we speak to local agents that's very much obviously it's establishing it and getting it let up as quickly as you can but it's really important that the quality side is there as well and it's you know some agents get that some some don't so and I, I definitely want to touch on that understanding the tenant and the customer more which we'll, we'll come on to but Nicola you, you mentioned tech obviously that's a, a great segue into one of the other topics <laughs> to talk about. Um, you know, it's a, I find it very fascinating in this space you know how much technology there is how disconnected some of that technology can sometimes be often within the same organization um, and I suppose what what do you find are the key differences in the tech stack that you need for a successful BTR than you did from a leasehold perspective? I'll throw that to the floor. Um, for us, we we haven't used a massive amount of different tech that we were using before, but we have built on what we had. So for us, it's about taking what we were doing initially and doing more of all of it. So it's better communication, um, self-serve for the residents that's really vital a portal then to be able to do that is for build trend is 
um, is central. And then um, reporting for the clients is whatever we were reporting on before is increase it by 50, 75, 100%. Um, so we it's kind of just moving forward with, with what we had and becoming more digital than we were before. Yeah, so coming from our side in a similar sort of story that there's a differences, but they're quite nuanced. I mean, in terms of obviously, the, you know, tenant journey starts a little bit earlier in that we, you know, that relationship comes before they move into the flat and like block management, it's when the purchase happens. Um, so, you know, you need the right IT to start that relationship early on. So we've got a, a tenant app that we've launched this year, which has been really helpful in terms of um, creating that sort of one-stop shop for the tenant to be able to sort of interact with us once they're going through the kind of referencing process. So starting the journey much earlier is really helpful. And then that kind of, because obviously you're inside the, the front door, it's it's been able to sort of interact with people really quickly on the app, which has been really helpful. Um, obviously there's letting software, which we need, which I'm sure everyone does. Um, but yeah, absolutely second that around the data. It's, it's that kind of performance reporting is really nuanced and the granular detail that we are looking at now is something that we've never been asked for before in sort of worked in property 20 years and it, it's huge and so technology can support that and then the next bit which I don't think we're there yet and as an industry there's probably a bit of work is the insight that that leads to and what, what you, how you can really be data driven and what you do with the technology to with your data to sort of drive your decisions in future but that's that's where we're sort of focusing at the moment on. And do you find that, I mean, you know, I, I do hear sort of a lot of frustration that the, you know, there is a lot of data out there, but the operators don't really want to share it with each other at this point. I think that's inevitable, isn't it? It's, you know, the, the data is, I think data is one thing, turning into actionable, actionable points is another thing. Uh, that's the, the difficulty. And I think when people figure out how to do that, they don't really want to give that market advantage away to their competitors. I, I think... As, as the market develops, we'll see more sharing of data, more sharing of knowledge. I think it's, and if you look at the US market, they're there already. You know, data's monetized, it, it's, it's, you can buy data to make decisions. We're not quite there yet in the, in the UK market, but I think we will get there eventually. And can I ask a, a second question to you, Paul? Obviously, you're part of a, a group that's got a lot of different technology. You know, there's lots of brands within that group. So what, what was the process that you went through to identify, well, you know, what do we want our tech stack for B to look like? Um, yeah, it was, it's been an interesting journey. I think we've spoken to uh, sort of Nicola and Oliver saying that they're, they're still using, this, you know, they've not changed systems. We we started uh, sort of built Terrain in 2017. Um, we were lucky that we had two built around buildings to go after. Um, we, we started with the systems we had within group. Um, and I think it being two buildings with on-site teams, actually the tech side is important, but slightly less so than a disparate portfolio. Um, so we sort of used that period to see what the group had and actually decide what we didn't want um, and what we did want. And then, you know, as we've a little bit of a test period, we've sort of gone away and right, actually we need this, this, this. And the key thing was systems that talk to each other. And so what the resident has one system, our on-site team has one system, our leasing team has one system, our branch network ties into that system as well. So everything talks to each other. We can make decisions, we can make sure nothing gets missed. And that's that was the sort of key thing, what system we ended up with. You know, we've had lots of conversation on that down and it's it, that was the key thing systems that talk to each other and inform each other rather than being very separate from each other. And Catherine, I suppose to, to go a bit uh, deeper into that, you're one of the, the newer BTR brands out there, so maybe don't have all of that legacy technology that other companies that have been operating um, 20 odd years will have. Um, again, how did that factor in? You know, did that sort of liberate you in terms of selecting what your tech stack should look like? Yeah, I think we were really lucky, as you said, Dan, we didn't have any legacy issues. Um, we spent a considerable amount of time on tech, weekly tech calls, discussing beauty parades, as you can imagine. So I think it's probably echoing um, comments everybody else has made a single source of truth for us. We don't want people double keying, double entering the data. We want to make sure that all the tech talks to each other. Um, we um, Our data flows between all of our tech stack pretty seamlessly. So we use a CRM system which captures the inquiries from Rightmove. Our resident portal integrates with that, which integrates with MRI, um, and then fixed flow for the repairs and maintenance. I think for us, it is, um, as Nicola was saying, where we don't have that on-site presence, that communication, that ability to be able for residents to communicate with us and them to communicate both ways. Um, but I do think that 
because we're encouraging our residents to engage with our tech stack at the earliest opportunity, it does bring us management efficiencies, but also the renters of today do want things instantly. It's all done on their phone. It can be done on the desktop. Um, so it, we, we have spent considerable time, money and effort to ensure that we've got what we think is best in class. Yeah. And to touch on the point you made there, sorry, were you going to say something, Holly? No, no, no. Um, yeah, in terms of the what the uh, residents are expecting from technology and expecting from that service delivery, how do you see that differ between a traditional block and BTR? Was that a question for me? And for, for anyone, <laughs> we'll go for me first, Catherine, and then yeah, if anyone else wants to jump in. I think it, it goes back to being inside the front door. So it's the repairs and maintenance. Um, we're not running a service charge budget, we're running an operational budget. So the communication with the residents is completely different. I think because we're involved at that early stage with that inquiry, that lease up, that move in, that handover, the, the ongoing resident engagement, I do think um, it, it is completely different to the, the long leasehold world. Um, and I do think our tech enables us to communicate in different languages to different age groups. That said, we are a tech led company, but we do appreciate if we need to put an AST in the poster to an older resident who wants to read it, well, we will do that. <laughs> so I think we, we, um, we flex our tech and our, our approach depending on the, the resident, the site and, and also client requests as well. Yeah, uh, again, second a lot of that. And I th I think I guess where it comes in really important is what we said earlier around the single family side where you don't have, you know, built around early doors was very much built on sort of people centric and, you know, your, your sort of property manager, concierge, whoever sort of building that new community. Um, where you've got this sort of transient community and have people moving into single family um, accommodation. It's, it's the tech is really important in terms of that community piece and how we can use that to build that community as well as our, because we won't necessarily have an on-site presence or as much as certainly the urban side of things. So it becomes really important to kind of, build that which is on block management not quite so much it's you know that is very much professional it's very much around self-service and people being able to access information and have good flow of information all the time but that kind of idea of building that community piece where you might you know you might not have that on-site presence is, is where it comes really important I think. And I think communities and single family housing just to pick up on that are different so generally we're seeing busy families who are doing school runs swimming gymnastics you know, they, they're, they're not going to go and have a pizza night. Um, it might be that we can recommend a local swimming instructor or a childminder, or I think it's just pushing out different um, different resident benefits and a different building, a different sense of community. It might be an ice cream van that we'll organise to, to come around in the summer. It, it's, it is very different to the, the multifamily world, I'd say. Yeah, totally. The only point I was going to make previously, Dan, was just, I think, on, on tech, it's just, you know, it's something we all know has been underinvested in for for years, I think, in, in property management compared to other industries. And I think with the new kind of investment that's coming in and, and what's happening in property industry at the moment, it's it's accelerating really quickly. And there's, there's so much now constantly that's coming through that you just, you know, it's, it's sounds really cheesy, but it's quite cool stuff that comes through and you think, well, great, we could, you know, and it's it's easy to kind of pick up and, 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 and use. So I think, we'll I think the, 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 the customer expectation is so much higher as well. Because yeah. if you buy a, a lease off flight, you almost you don't choose who your agent is, you don't choose the free or the, they are what they are when you turn up and the service you get will differ from very good with my colleagues here to not quite so good. I think if you, you move into a built rent building or you know even a PRS building, you, you're making that decision to probably pay a little bit more for a premium service. And if that service doesn't reach that standard, you, you know we will know about it as, as operators. So it, it sets a high bar for us to reach text part of that the customer service that you know the, the the team interaction is really important but the the expectation levels are so much higher and that holds us to a higher standard yeah absolutely we found with like the long lease hold stuff we were doing before a lot of the tech conversation we were having was about back end how that supported our processes and the, on the occasion we would try and put um kind of customer focused tech in actually that sometimes was really challenging to get residents engaged in that that they it was really difficult whereas in built to rent and single family now it's the other way actually there we have to keep up with the residents expectations because they will expect the best all the time they there's constant um, development and we need to keep up with that and that is a challenge and I suppose that's the difference between you know you choose to rent and live as a service whereas you know, from well I you know I live in a leasehold block myself you know it's very much uh, the service charge budget's about cost controlled 
Um, yeah. I suppose uh, another question to throw openly: how how do you find that then differs working with clients where you know an RMC is all about you know trying to get the service charge budget down as low as possible, or at least ours is, versus a, a BTR client who's more focused on income, gross to net leakage, and a completely different set of KPIs. I think it, I think it's quite it's quite refreshing actually because um, with. <laughs> There's a synergy with what's good for most built to rent investors is actually good for the customer. If customers are happy, they will stay longer, less voids, they will pay more, rents go up. And it, it's sort of self-fulfilling. If you can justify to your client, we will we need to do this, we need to spend this money because it's good for the customer, they'll stay longer. Actually, that's quite an easy conversation with an RMC where they're paying the bills and they get, you know, their investment is worth the same either way. It's a different sort of narrative. Um, so it's, for me, it's been quite refreshing being built around. You can, if you can just fight to your client, they will tend to do it. You know, not all at the same time, and there's a cost limit to that. But the, there's a different mindset. It feels like with build to rent, sometimes it's more collaborative with the client than we've found yeah. before. So we, it feels like we're all working towards the same aim. We all want to achieve the same thing, and they will support us in what we need to do to implement that and that's not that that's not always been the case with other forms of management before but perhaps sometimes that line it was a little bit more blurred as to you trying to do something for the residents and do something else for the client and that is that's you know can can be difficult so yeah the build to rent is as paul said refreshing definitely I think yeah. it's um, it's refreshing in and and some our clients are st we're still under pressure with our budgets. Um, you know, this yeah. we're not governed by the same legislation, and we don't have a number of leaseholders that we're accountable to and have to show that service charge budget. You know, everyone's aware you just pay your rent, and it's all inclusive generally from the repairs and maintenance. There's no additional costs like there are in the leasehold world. But I still think we're all under um, under pressure from an operational budget perspective, um, especially with, and that goes back to tech as well. So looking at technology in place to reduce those running costs, whether it's smart sensors for lights to turn off in, in apartments and in the communal areas. I do think um, it's more of a holistic approach from the budget setting because we're involved so early. It's that mobilization, lettings, looking at that rent, looking at the unit mix. It's all encompassing, I think. Running, running a, a, a block is the same, whether it's a PBSA block, a long leasehold block or a, or a BTR block. It's, it's pushing of the rents, it's maximizing that income. It's, as um, somebody recently just said on the call, it's that customer satisfaction, happy tenants stay longer, less repairs, less voids. Um, it, it's really that customer journey, but also just ensuring that you've got a building that's efficient to run as possible, but that the rental side and inside that front door is the, is the, just the complete game changer between long lease hold. Yeah, I think that, and that comes through in how we measured in that, you know, with, with Block, it's very much around, as you say, the spend and, and how we are kind of managing the, the life cycle of the building and the asset itself, whereas that is obviously a big part. And, and a lot of our contracts have that net operating income sort of target, which means, means we're all aligned to that. But a lot of the measurements we have or KPIs we have around satisfaction and, and how we can demonstrate a really good service and um, ESG and, and that kind of part, which is which is you don't often find on, on the block side. So, yeah, I think that feeds through into how we, you know, we measured from from the clients. So I think, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed we got half an hour in without only mentioning ESG once. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, I was going to say that. So, uh, again, you know, what are you seeing as a, a difference between what clients are asking you for? from an ESG perspective? I mean, is the average RMC aware of ESG? Is that something that your developers are pushing more? And we'll throw it to a cap first. Sorry, was that to me? Yeah, well, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're, um, yeah. I think um, ESG is another buzzword, isn't it? I think wellness, resident wellness, um, energy performance, utility costs are, are rocketing. So I think, everybody's um, wanting good resident retention, happy tenants, wanting to ensure that they're um, setting uh, good ESG policies and strategies. I do think there's a, a lot of talk and not much action. Um, Verb Life are taking it seriously. We, we're one of the um, first residential managers to get our B Corp pending in. Um, we, we bake ESG into our approach, whether it's with our residents, our renters, our consultancy or our clients. So yeah, for us, it's top of the agenda, absolutely. 
So, and Paul, are you seeing you know, that when people are you know, building developments to sell, which I assume you guys obviously do as well, are you seeing ESG being factored into the builds of those, or you know, is it as prominent as an investor that's going to hold that asset and rent it out? I think it's it, it is it is is getting there. It's less um, less of a decision making factor in in the build to sell market. Um, I think build to rent, it's you know from the, the the funds that earn and the developers, it's, it's a bigger thing for them, but it's also a bigger thing for the customer. I think we, we see with, you know, the, the list of priorities our customers have in build to rent schemes, actually the environmental side, not just for, not just because of costs and all, you know, what's going on at the moment, it's just the principle of the, the environmental impact is, is really important. And, you know, the, the other side, the, the sort of placemaking and the, the, the cultural impact, that's part of the reason why they choose these developments. I think that's slightly different to build to sell. I think there's more of a, um, I don't know, just a pure cost and an, as an asset investment type decision making rather than I want to live in that building because they take, you know, the environmental impact of the building and from a building and operating is more important. So I think it's, it's a different, it is a little bit of a different mindset. I think everyone's moving forward, possibly the build to rent customer base is moving forward quicker. I think clients are taking it more seriously. We don't have the legacy issues that some of the leasehold blocks have. We're working on everything you build. Um, so clients, you know, aren't having to um, aren't having to deal with the retrofit or, or the issues to improve the, mm. the performance of their buildings. But there is the debate about in the in the BTL world, getting Briam excellent is it important. We're not seeing enough stock trade yet, but our funds are only going to purchase if it is Briam excellent or have got EPCs of A. I think mm. funds are thinking that way, but I think schemes that are coming out of the ground now it's too late i think it, it's as of today where we're sat in design team meetings or pre-planning meetings where clients are really thinking if i'm trading this asset in four years time i want to get rear maximum and i want a grade apcs epcs yeah I, I just think point as well it's, it's really important it's not just the customers and clients it's the staff that, that work for us as well are really um people we're coming in now to our entry level jobs are, are really interested in ESG and what our commitments are and we, we get asked quite a lot when we're interviewing um, what our commitments are and where we demonstrate it so I think you know the world again over the last few years has changed hasn't it and people are very very uh, more switched on and more in tune with, with ESG and, and what it kind of means but there has to be as you say the substance behind it and be able to show that you, you, you take it seriously and I think our, our kind of with developers in the built in the um, block management side I, I find it a really mixed bag I think some do treat their development like it's a legacy issue you know and that they want to make create something that's really sustainable in the community and do something really positive with it others are very less inclined to so we find it a real sort of mixed bag on, on that side and out of interest do you find that that scales on the size of the developer and you know, the the larger they are the more aware they are of it or is it a complete mixed bag i think developer i have to be really careful on that Dan. i think there's i think there's it's some developers look at it as a long-term project and they will, will stay on site for a long time after they've built the development and sold the flats off. Others look to sort of move off a little bit quicker and it, it can range between that. And yeah, there's, there's lots of implications of where the development is and stuff, but it, yeah, it, it, it's for each sort of client, I guess, is a bit different. Fair enough. Um, and then going a bit more into the, the sort of demands of the clients and client reporting. So I think there was a point made right at the start that, you know, sort of 50% more reports, so we might have 50 times more reports. Um, yeah, what are, the, what are the main different reporting points you're being asked for? And you know, how have you catered either with systems or processes to make sure that you're getting the right data to your clients on time? Um, start with Nicola. There. Yeah, the reporting has been a real learning curve for us because it's about, I think the same types of reports that we were delivering before, but just much more granular. They want to see timings between milestones in processes. They want to understand in much more detail demographics. Um, there's obviously all of the financial reporting, which was quite in depth before, but is even more in depth now. Um, and all the reporting that we come, that comes from resident surveys and all those things that we're doing much more of now to understand understand what the community feel about certain issues and how they can develop that further. It's just all a lot more, more granular, uh, granular. And uh, yeah, the clients, that's certainly been, um, been a, a change for us is, and we've had to adapt to that in being able to deliver what they're ex expecting. Right. Another question. Um, 
so we we obviously see a lot of investors who want agents to dial into their systems um, I suppose the, as this was sort of a knowledge bank and a lessons learned thing, is, have any of you got experience of where you've had to dial into someone else's system? Um, you know, would you avoid that if you could? What are the pros and cons? Just, yeah, I'll throw that to Paul first. But <laughs> interested you. to hear your guys' opinions on that. Yeah, I I think in the market we're in, it's a, it's almost an inevitability that clients will want that for very, very good reasons. They, they may have a very large portfolio. They don't want to put with one agent and they want to split it. Um, from their point of view, having that on one system makes sense. Um, it may be, we, we have clients where we just, we provide part of the process service, but they do some of it in-house. And I think, again, that's inevitable when clients get to a certain stage, they're gonna to wanna to bring in-house as much as possible. So we've, we try to take the view that we need to be flexible. It's fine as saying, we've got this system, it's brilliant and we're happy with it and we are, but sometimes clients will have their own system that we need to work on. So it's, I think from an agent point of view, it does create more work, more complexity. Um, so it's it's not to be undertaken lightly, but it can't be ignored. Um, and our, our risk is, you know, all the work and effort we put into our processes in our core system, how do we make sure we translate that to the, the performance of the client and also the customer experience at the front end? And that is more difficult on a system you've done 100% control. But, you've, you've, you know, sometimes you've got to do it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, I think it's um, we've got um, a client where we've got to report onto their health and safety system. Our tech all seamlessly talks to each other, so it is then a manual upload to their system because of API links. Um, but they want to report health and safety across their entire portfolio, and we're not managing their whole portfolio. So I think it is that flexible approach. Um, yeah, I think really, as, as Paul said, you, you've got to work with your clients and if they've got that requirement, then absolutely. But we still want to report health and safety across our portfolio and our systems as well. So we, we are double entering in some occasions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the challenge that we have a client who's sort of building an end to end solution, which we've happily sort of involved in and, and happy to work on. But we've just been really clear from the outset that it just needs to be market standard, you know, it cut it. it for every element that we use it for it needs to be able to do everything that our own tech can do and, and if not more so at the moment we're using it in a positive way in that you know we can it can help shape what we do on, on our side but we've, we've just been really clear that we're, we can only use it on the market or we can only use it if it if it does what what it needs to do um which is a yeah a challenge i think for us great nicola yeah, it's actually something we're talking about a lot at the moment and being flexible is really key as paul said um we can understand why our clients need that from us and we have to fit. So part of my role is looking at how that fits into our systems, potentially our processes and procedures, if the systems are separate um, and making sure that that all works and we still do everything we need to do in our systems because that's that's how we work and that we fit as efficiently as possible into the, into the client systems. It's not easy. It's not easy, but it's necessary. Another one I'm interested in as a, a lessons learned, how how different is the handover process for a BTR block than it is for a leasehold block? And we'll start again with you, Nicola. I love what we sort of do on, on leasehold is quite legacy. So it's handover is happened, you know, often often quite a long time ago and we were probably a lot less involved than we are on, on build to rent um on build to rent we're really we're really involved at all stages right from from the beginning through to to handover and that that's great for us it gives us a little bit more control as to what's going on a little bit more input um and a little bit more engagement as well probably um so yeah yeah quite different and ollie yeah, I'd say similar. I think we find we're a little bit earlier engaged with the uh, build to rent side because we're going to have to launch the um, development before it's ready. And, you know, most occasions, so we're involved, we get involved earlier along the line, which is helpful for us because we can then input into some of the design aspects. Um, the asset handover is pretty similar in terms of what we're looking at, but obviously with the in flat side of it for a build to rent. But I just think defects becomes a much bigger part for us. And we're, we're again learning on how we manage the effects process because where you've got somebody who's living in their flat and they've got an issue inside the property, the relationship often comes through us or is direct through us and it's looking at how we can support that and, and manage that 
um, again, through, through the systems that we use to make sure we have a really clear process on, on defect management. But yeah, I think that's it. I think the, the defect management is, is an interesting one because it's, you know, in a built rent block, you've got residents in there, something breaks in their flat, whether that's down to us to do or the developer is a defect, they don't care. You know, they just want it fixing as quickly as possible. So it, us sitting in the middle and managing that conversation with the developer or client and the customer is, is challenging. Um, you know, it, it's you know, trying to communicate what the situation is, what we can do, and, and it, it explains to people without them having to know the detail. They don't care about the detail, what we're we going to do when and make sure it happens, which is a challenge because you've got different priorities between the developer who may um, have different time frames to work for than what our, our customers would expect. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that. I think that defects um, liability period is really tricky. Um, we're working with a client at the moment and their main contract are just agreeing what those call outs are going to be if there is an issue. Um, and it is different from a leasehold perspective. So I think the example, somebody, um, I think it was two weeks to replace white goods. Well, I was like, you can't you can't have a resident without a fridge for two weeks. So <laughs> this isn't going to work. So um, conscious of costs and, you know, the, the contract is onto another site. But I think there's some of those SLAs that we're definitely sitting down with clients in, at that handover stage to say what does need to be rectified within certain timescales um, and then managing that expectation. So, and, and our, our tech allows us to, assist the clients in that handover period tracking any any defects so if we notice that we've got a, a run on balcony doors not not closing properly we can report that back to the the client they can follow it up with the contractor and i think we go back to that data capture what's important single source of truth one one system that manages it all for us i think some of the, the some of the contracts for the sort of forward fund or agree purchase are actually helping that because the buyer is buying it as a built rent asset these things they're, they're baking into the the, the, the contract's purchase so, you know, think spares, you know, white goods, you, you know, you may hold three or four spares of washing machine in the building that you drop them into the flat with a problem and then the, the defect replaces the spare. And that's, you can't do that in a leasehold building. It's not, it's not an option, but within a build to rent option, you can sort of build that into the model. So the customer experience is more straightforward. Yeah. So conscious that we're coming up to the time, you know, there's one question that I'll ask the, sort of each of you. Um, and then we can take any Q&A from the audience. So if there are any questions anyone's got, feel free to type them in the chat now. Um, I suppose, are there, yeah, is there a, a number one or sort of a key learning that you've um, amassed from your transition from block into BTR, a, a sort of final words of wisdom that you'd want to pass on to everyone in attendance? Uh, Catherine, we'll start with you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, a couple from me, probably. I think this theme's run through, but... Um... I think reporting, don't underestimate the data that you need to capture and report um, for your institutional clients, absolutely, and for your own business. And I think the other one is um, understanding that the mobilization phase can be all consuming. Um, for me, don't underestimate the amount of time that you need to mobilize a building and the different facets that's involved in it. I think, um, and that's all the way from the letting strategy, the, you know, pricing of the units, recruiting staff. I think mobilization is, um, is the the hardest part i think uh yeah the ongoing property management probably <laughs> is the easiest <laughs> right then nicola for me i would just say reporting the same really you can't underestimate it put the data at the at the center of what you're doing two things data at the center and customer experience and build everything else around that those are the two the two really key fundamentals. Right. And Ollie, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it's tempting to say same, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. But in, in saying something different, I guess um, central services was a learning point for us in that we had an accounts team, a finance team, had an income collection team, but it's nuanced. Um, so just kind of for thinking that and making sure you've got the right skill set in terms of your, your central services that, that you might provide on, on block already. Um, Recognise it's a little bit different in the rental world and people, obviously, the obvious one, but it's it does, you know, a part of this was around moving to build to rent from block. And I think there is, it will work for some people and not for others, but it's that fast paced kind of um, agile environment. And there are people that are really flourish there, but making sure you get that right kind of person on site can bring the community to life is really, really important. Yeah. Right. And then Paul? Um, I think for me is uh, don't be afraid of feedback and don't be afraid of procuring feedback. Um, you know, the obvious thing is from customers and asking them what we've done well, what we could do better, what we've done badly. Um, 
but also in that same conversation with with the team. Um, I'm always conscious that sometimes I'm a little bit removed from what the team is doing on a day to day basis. So we sort of make a point of sitting down regularly, go, what's causing you a problem? What system would you need? You know, how can we be better at what we're doing? And that, you know, asking those questions regularly has come up with some really interesting solutions that we probably wouldn't have thought of without asking for that feedback. I mean, coming from a block point of view, it's sometimes a little bit of a thankless task. If everything's fine, no one cares. And as soon as something goes wrong, it's the end of the world. I think we built built around pe people are more willing to give constructive feedback. Great. I'm conscious that we've ran over the slightly, so we'll, we'll skip the, the Q&A and I'll hand back over to Vicky to close the webinar. Um, but thank you very much for all your insight there, guys. Hmm. All right, guys. Thank you all. Um, I think that was really good. I think a lot everyone can take a lot of key information away from that discussion. Um, thank you all so much for your time today and for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, I can't see there's no more questions that have come through, but if anyone would like to speak with any of our panelists directly, then I'm sure they will, they will be happy to hear from you and answer any questions. So please let me know. Um, as I mentioned, the recording will be available later today. Um, I will send all of the attendees a link once that's available. Um, if you're interested in joining us for any other knowledge banks, then please keep a lookout on the News on the Block website. Um, otherwise, thank you all for joining us today and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Guys. See you later. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.